Good afternoon and welcome back to the Maine Public Health Association 2022 annual meeting. I hope you were able to get outside and get a bit of a stretch break during the, the um, lunch break just now. Uh, I'm excited to welcome you to our next session, Developing, Implementing and Adapting Virtual Programming, Education and Care. My name is Becca Bolas and I'll be moderating today's session. I just wanna give you a couple of reminders before I introduce our speakers. The first is that we're offering conference captioning services. Within each session, you will automatically be provided with captioning, which will appear beneath the video stream. You can click the link to access it in a separate window if you prefer. And if you don't need the conference captioning service, you can push the pause stop button to stop the stream. The second reminder is just to please be sure to complete the session evaluation. I will remind you another time, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it's just four short questions and your feedback is very helpful to us as we um, look to improve our, our programming and it's a, it is required if you're seeking continuing education credits. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our session moderator, Jen Gunderman from the University of New England and an NPHA board member. So with that, Jen, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Becca, and thanks for being here today. My name is Jen. I am the director of the Maine Area Health Education Center, otherwise known as Maine ADHEC, and a board member with the Maine Public Health Association. I'm really happy to bring you today's topic and panel. As a bit of introduction, um, I remember many, 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 many years ago, I read a book um, by Michael Crichton called Five Patients. It was actually written in 1968, a fictional book. Um, in this one of the chapters, um, there was a patient, a 56 year old mom of three, who is experiencing chest pains on a flight from Los Angeles to Boston. Upon landing, she's whisked away to this fictional Logan Airport medical station. This patient, Sylvia, was diagnosed with the help of a closed circuit television through a black and white video feed. She was examined by a doctor three miles away at Mass General Hospital, with an on site nurse conducting labs and tests. The fictional story continues that the doctor signed a prescription with something Michael Crichton called a telewriter. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, 50 plus years <laughs> later, um, and we gather virtually um, to learn and discuss about this once fictional, almost science-fi-like way of doing public health and healthcare business. So I'd like to welcome you all um, and particularly welcome our panelists today, which include Valerie Jackson from MCD Global Health, Kayla Sargent, Lynn Connolly, Marin Johnson, and Grace Price from Maine Health, Sana Osman from Maine Access Immigrant Network, Renee Wolf, a consultant with Maine Medical Division of Preventive Medicine. In today's session, we will hear from the panelists and then we'll open it up for question and answer. Thank you. I believe we're beginning this panel with a poll question. Yes, please. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And <clears throat> Frederick, if you could please launch the poll now. I'm Valerie Jackson, and I am very um, excited to be here today to talk to you about what MCD Global Health has done to advance and promote the ongoing training and development and increasing the workforce around community health workers who are such an important part of our workforce. There's a poll that we have just launched uh, trying to find out just to take a temperature of the room to see if you're familiar with community health workers, whether you've had the experience of um, or the benefit of experiencing services with or working with community health workers. I know some organizations refer to them as chows. Uh, I may use CHW as I'm talking, and that's really helpful to have that information. I'm seeing some votes coming in. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important. There's many, uh, many different things that community health workers do, and it's never does uh, the right service to distill it down to a brief definition. But I think a broad definition is that a community health worker is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and or has an unusually close understanding of the community served. And by understanding the role that community health workers play in our system, in our communities, in our state, and across the world, actually, um, we are super excited to be able to continue to create mechanisms for them to advance and enhance skills. 
So what I'm talking about today regarding adaptability is um, we know that there is a high demand for community health workers. And we also know that there is a demand for additional training and some building of core competencies for our colleagues. And so when COVID hit back in 2019, 2020, we quickly realized as an organization that all classes, well, most classes just stopped. And so we had to think about how could we continue to support the workforce, the employees and the organizations that employ community health workers. So because they played such a key role and actually during COVID, the need and the impact of community health workers was brought to a new level. And I think a lot of eyes were opened at the impact that they have had uh, across the country. So as this placed new demands on us and traditionally all the classes were held in person, uh, MCD Global Health had to decide what could we do. And so we convened an advisory group and that advisory group consisted of folks from the national um, level to a local level, to community health workers, experts in the field. And we said, we wanna design something new and we're gonna create what we called a hybrid model. And so we didn't wanna lose the impact of getting a group of folks together and learning and growing as a cohort. And we developed a model that utilized our online training modules. Then, then we completed that, these sessions with virtual training of a classroom style, like we're kind of doing today. And so back in um, early 2021, we looked and we have Maine Health, had, I'm, excuse me, <laughs> Maine, uh, MCD has a long history of being a leader in e-learning. And we have chronic condition modules that have been available to anyone in Maine to take such as chronic disease management around uh, COPD or diabetes and with COVID. And so we use that existing technology to develop core competency modules. So we now offer a 40 hour class. We have held three cohorts over the last year. So um, we launched a pilot in 2021. We do a 40 hour training over eight weeks. And um, at that time, it's self-paced modules. And then following each self-paced module, we bring the cohort together as a group. And what we're able to do with that group, which is really amazing, is work together, learn together, get an understanding of the landscape, what happens, what's challenging for CHWs as we're bringing and learning new skills. The online sessions and the virtual sessions cover everything from um, communication skills to advocacy, service coordination and resources, building capacity, cultural humility. And those are just enhanced by the ability to break into groups and speak with each other and learn together. So we've held three cohorts uh, attended by 45 people and many from Maine, but we also had folks from urban Chicago, Navajo Nation, rural Alabama and South Carolina. And we evaluate every session and 90% of our attendees said they really um, took those skills and have felt they not only increased their skills, but 80% of them has, have already applied those new skills that they've learned in their day-to-day -day work. We are currently running a class and it's the same model. We have loved it and it's working well and we tend to have a waiting list. Um, we have 18 participants in the class now and we really were intentional because there is a high demand for this that we have um, brought a group together that represents broad geographical and organizational representation from across Maine. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is hot off the presses that MCD was just recently um, applied for and earned certification by the Maine Department of Labor as the organizational sponsor for a CHW apprenticeship program in Maine. And we are partnering with organizations, some of who you'll hear from today, um, so that we have developed this nice add-on to our core competency training that provides an apprenticeship program over time with additional training and support. So we can continue to grow, develop this workforce and really um, raise the role to the level that we think it needs to be recognized as. Welcome to any questions that you have and I think we'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you, Valerie. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Sargent. I'm a program manager for Maine Health, and I'm joined by my colleague, Lynn Connolly. Lynn and I will be speaking today about how innovation at Maine Health has improved access to health information for our patients. And I'm opening up with the definition of social determinants of health from Healthy People 2030. 
Social determinants of health are conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning, quality of life outcomes, and risks. Studies have shown that social determinants of health account for as much as 80% of health outcomes. Some examples of these determinants include safe housing, access to education and job opportunities, income, access to nutritious foods, and more. Lynn and I are here to discuss one social determinant of health in particular today, and that's health literacy. We want to share just one example of the ways that our team has used technology to help address health literacy for patients in the main health system. Health literacy is people's capacity to obtain, understand, and use the information that they need to make good choices about their health. It can be considered a social determinant of health, both directly by impacting health outcomes and indirectly by affecting other social determinants of health. As stated in the World Health Organization Shanghai Declaration on Promoting Health in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, health literacy empowers and drives equity. Using plain language when conveying health information makes it accessible to the largest number of people possible. That means that they can fully understand and use the information. In the example we're about to share, access to patient education was gatekeeping patient access to care and improved health outcomes. Digital formats allow for easy implementation of health literate design, and this is often called the bite snack meal design. It gives individuals just the right amount of content to meet their needs. Design features also include sub pages, tools and tips and interactive elements, and all of these features help to break up the content, support understanding and provide detailed information to patients who want it without overwhelming those who don't. I'm going to pass this over to Lynn now to tell us more about the innovation and opportunity to move Maine Health's life-saving kidney transplant education program to an online format. Thanks, Kayla. For a little background, the Maine Transplant Program at Maine Medical Center is the only program of its kind in the state, and a requirement for a patient to be added to the National Transplant Registry is the completion of a class that educates them on the benefits, risks, and the process of receiving a kidney. So when the COVID pandemic caused the cancellation of in-person classes, the Maine Transplant Program contacted us at Education and Training to find a way for patients to still receive that education. And we wanted to do it in a way that would be easiest for patients to understand. So prior to the pandemic, we had been looking into online class platforms. So thankfully we had already done a lot of research and we decided to go with Thinkific since it has the features that we wanted while also being affordable. And while I was learning and building the platform, other members of our team worked with MTP to update and revise their presentation to meet health literacy and branding standards and to turn it into a video. So the final Think of It class included the video a quiz to reinforce the most vital information, a PDF of the slides, a short video testimonial from a previous patient, and the next steps the patient would need to take if they wanted to continue. But the only required lessons were the main video and the quiz. By moving the class online, many previous issues were eliminated. Patients could take it from the comfort of their own home at a time that was convenient for them instead of traveling from all over the state. They were able to review any of the information they needed to at any time throughout the process. Multiple family members and caregivers could also take the class, which ensured they received all the correct information firsthand instead of it being relayed through the patient. And every patient received the exact same information that had already gone through the health literacy review process. And so since launching the kidney transplant education class, we've created over 100 other online classes for departments throughout Maine Health. Some are completely on Thinkific, and others are a combination of Thinkific and live Zoom meetings where Thinkific is used for the class content, discussion boards, and Facebook-like communities. Uh, but each class goes through the same review process um, for, to review the content for health literacy standards and to ensure patients will be able to understand the information. And so we are looking forward to continuing to create more classes and get to more patients. Uh, 
if we could just unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Thank everybody. You. Sorry. We all um, do it. <laughs> my name is Sana Osman. I'm a community health worker at Maine Access Immigrant Network, which is an ethnic-based nonprofit community organization and a community health worker program. Uh, I'm also on the board of two nonprofits, uh, CAKE, which is Cons Consumers for Affordable Healthcare and uh, Cross-Cultural Community Services, CCCCS. I'll be speaking to you today about one of the projects at Maine. Uh, we work in this project uh, and we worked with uh, professionals or providers from Maine Health, as well as Maine Medical Partners. It's called Ask the Doctor. It is a community-based question and answer Zoom sessions where the community members can come in and join and ask questions to the providers and, uh, and the providers would provide answers for them and the people can join in either through a video or through calling. And what, no matter where the locations are, uh, we've had people join us from uh, Maine, state of Maine and also other states in the United States and other countries like Canada. We've had people from the UK, we've had people join us from the United Arab Emirates. And the idea started out before the pandemic and it became urgently needed as COVID unfolded. Before the pandemic, Maine facilitated a monthly uh, Healthy You workshops. Uh, we invited people to our office and then we had a medical provider and we were interpreting to the languages that we serve, uh, the communities that we serve, uh, which are French, Arabic, and Somali. And in these sessions, we've had people, be we've had the number of people we've had was between 10 to 40 people in these workshops. And so after, when we started the Zoom session, this was one once a month, but when we started the Zoom sessions, we made three, they are now three a month, and each one dedicated to one language. Uh, as I said, the three languages that we serve, uh, French, Somali, and Arabic. And they're focused, they have been focused mostly about COVID-19 and the question that our community had about COVID-19 and, uh, and uh, but we have discussed the broad range of health topics uh, as we went along. As a community health worker, our uh, job with these, uh, our, what we should, our job was to facilitate these sessions. And also we, uh, we interpreted for our community and we also facilitated the aftercare, meaning if there's any questions that needed to be answered after the session, or if people needed to contact our provider in any way to follow up, that's what we were uh, there to help. And this became a very critical, uh, uh, of, I think, for increasing the vaccine rate in our communities, for example, uh, and the questions that we've had from our clients, especially about the vaccine hesitancy has been very broad. And we had a lot of uh, questions from the community around that time. Uh, thank you. And I'll uh, switch to Renee. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Renee Wolf. I'm a physician and I'm a consultant that works um, with Marin and Grace and Sana. And I had the I had the great honor of working with Sana on the Ask the Docs, which was, um, I think, really a transformative experience for me personally, but also for the work that we do. Um, but I'm going to talk about our ECHO project. Um, we created a co-produced uh, community initiative. And I, I should just mention the Ask the Doc was also co-produced. There was shared leadership with the community members and uh, with the community health workers, which I think really contributed to its success. But um, we produced a uh, innovative educational webinar series to discuss barriers to healthcare that are faced by um, the immigrant members of our communities. Um, in this series, community leaders and community health workers, educated providers, and shared patient stories about the difficulties that this particular disenfranchised community faced when they try to engage with healthcare. We use the Project ECHO format, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. It's usually used as a way to reach rural doctors, and it's usually taught by um, physicians uh, in some mecca of healthcare to reach uh, rural physicians that don't have access to uh, some of the um, opportunities that the other doctors do. But we flip this usual paradigm um, or the usual paradigm that you see with the Project ECHO by having the expertise come from the community. Um, so we learned from our Ask the Doc series how much information exists in the community that's really critical to meaningful community engagement. 
Um, and we used this ECHO platform to educate providers, be they physicians, nurses, social workers, case managers, or CHWs, on what barriers exist and how they are experienced by people. We really just wanted to start a dialogue that would not only promote um, mutual understanding, but also to start to look for real nuts and bolts solutions that could improve the experience of both patient and provider. And someone with expertise in the field uh, would explain the barriers. So there was a didactic component and then, a, and then there was some discussion. And then a community health worker would share a personal lived experience example of how this barrier impacted a patient. And I sharing this rich community-based knowledge about the topic brought, I think, deeper understanding and a context for dialogue. Um, so we originally tasked to put on six of these echoes, but they were immediately successful, which I can assure you had nothing to do with how we were running them. It had to do, I think, with the thirst in the community for this type of dialogue. Uh, we were asked to extend it to a total of 10. So last year we put on 10 and we've been asked to continue it again this year. We had up to 100 participants. We discussed topics that were uh, that included language barriers, immigration status, mental health stigma, and system literacy. Um, it wasn't always easy. Uh, there were definitely some hiccups, but this um, co-produced uh, uh, innovative platform did allow us to showcase um, that dialogue between groups that share patients and goals is possible, and we believe necessary. We were able to highlight the amazing and expansive work that CHWs um, would do, that they do as members of community health teams. Um, and we learned that people really want to have these difficult conversations. And I'll just end by saying that doing this in a way that's co-produced with shared leadership is possible. And this was a team effort. And like I said, I wanna just make sure that um, Marin and Grace who are also on this um, panel were integral to this effort. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for providing just and sharing such rich experiences that you've had um, with your work and with the community. There's clearly some common themes here, um, maximizing resources, um, particularly when they can be quite limited. Um, another theme was just the importance of partnerships, and sometimes the most important partnership can be with the community, um, the community leaders, the community members, um, to really understand what the needs are, but as well as the strengths, the expertise, and the resources, and empower those, and really shine an important light. We're now going to open it up to questions. Before I do, I do want to also uh, mention that Grace Price um, and Marin Johnson are also part of the panel who will be providing responses to any questions or comments. We're going to start off with uh, a first question. You've all spoken so eloquently about the effectiveness of your programs, and no doubt it has been um, really important work done here in Maine. Could you talk about maybe one of those challenges that you faced that you didn't expect that if you were going to do it again, that you might modify a little bit or change? Right, Valerie. Hi. Um, yes, that's really a great question. We um, find that we're modifying with every new cohort. So we take evaluation and feedback and we make adjustments. But one of the interesting things was um, in order to fully participate in, so just again, we do, someone would do a virtual session. There's usually some homework and then they come prepared each week to discuss and learn as a group. And oftentimes our folks that were enrolled in our classes were not actually having the, free, the time to come and be present in class. So we might be having a discussion and someone might take off and say, I'll be right back. I have to go do a COVID test with someone in the clinic. And so they would miss the beauty of the virtual connection. And so this time what we did as an adjustment was we said, we really want you, if you're applying to participate in this, to go to your supervisor and show them this letter that says, not only is it a letter of approval, but it's a letter of commitment that you're gonna give the people the time they need uninterrupted to participate in class. We're two classes in and actually one is happening right now. So I'm not in that one, uh, but I can say from the, uh, this is our third week, but last week we didn't have any of those kind of interruptions. So it's really nice. Um, and that was an, a nice adjustment that we made. 
Great, thank you, Belly. That's a really great specific example. Sana. Yes, I would say one of the challenges, I think it was the, uh, the first challenge, was not just for the community, for us too, is learning how to uh, facilitate or how to work uh, virtually, how to do Zoom sessions. So we had a training on Zoom itself in the beginning, and we had to talk to our clients about how to use it, how to download the app, how to be able to access it. And so that was one of the first challenges that we had with the virtual platform. But it worked out, and so now I think people are professionals too. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sana. We sometimes forget, um, and we can be very naive that when we want to put on something virtually that we make this huge assumption that people understand and are comfortable with the technology. So, you know, making sure that that is a really good place to start from um, probably says a lot to the community that you understand and you hear and you want it to be successful for everybody. Thank you. Renee, I think I saw your hand up as well. I think, um, you know, for both, for particularly for the Ask the Doc, for me, because I was the doc in the beginning, one of the challenges, which turned out also be one of the, the great rewards was getting way out of your comfort zone. I mean, I was basically in a room, be it virtual or other, uh, with a whole bunch of people speaking a different language than I spoke. And I was the guest, which is a very different situation. And that actually um, ended up being a really great way to develop um, the relationships. And I think we learned, and we were surprised by how um, informal and how the informal atmosphere of Zoom really contributed to, to getting to um, questions that would not normally be asked in a formal setting. So I think we really benefited. I think I benefited from being the odd man out. And I think we benefited from how informal it was. Thank you, Renee. Speaking of that, just building off of the question, it's one question that I face quite often when we are talking about virtual learning is, um, was people's access to technology a challenge and how did you overcome that barrier? So Renee, I see no technology wasn't a barrier there. Valerie, it was for yeah. you. Could you describe how what that looked like and what were some of the solutions? Yes, I'm. I'm really happy to sh uh, share this too because I. It's one of, you know, I've been at my organization for just close to two years, and when we can address those and try to identify barriers and remove them or alleviate them, it's it's really an honor. Um, so access to technology is a problem. These were online modules, and then when you're connecting, it's Zoom. So we, I think, many of us in Maine tend to have some connection issues based on the weather. Occasionally, uh, we've all been in a meeting when things get fuzzy, but we had some participants that don't have any. They they were trying to connect and participate from a phone, and so we have partners, and through those partners, we've been able to offer loaner iPads. So we are able to identify up front if there's a need for technology, we'll get you an iPad. Um, and we have folks on staff that will be able to connect with people to help them with that connection. We also build in uh, time before the beginning of the session too around making sure that people have the connections they need and uh, if we can troubleshoot in any way. But it's nice to be able to have that loaner capacity. Thank you. Yes, Lynn. Yeah, we had you know, similar concerns. And so when we were researching what platform we wanted to use, uh, we found that about 76% of people who make under $30,000 a year still have smartphones. So we made sure to choose a platform that, that converted easily, you know, that could easily be viewed, all of the content could be viewed on, on a smartphone as well as you know, it didn't, you didn't have to be on a computer or even a tablet. And so I think that that made a, a pretty big difference. Um, and we've kind of figured that in overall, the barriers that were removed, like having to travel and things like mm -hmm. that, greatly outweighed mm -hmm. you know, the, the lack of, the, for the, the people who didn't, aren't, weren't completely comfortable. Um, but we also do every department that we work with, we also do make sure that they have a plan in place. So if we do, if there is somebody that either completely isn't comfortable with using any, any technology or for whatever reason that there's, there's a plan in place that they can still get that same education and content. Wonderful. Can, I just, can I just tag on to that real quick? Oh, um, sure. 
I mean, the other thing that with the with some of the community members that we dealt with, you would have one person around, um, you know, one person with a computer, but there would be four family members there. And or, you know, people could join in anonymously if they just wanted to be known as iPhone or they could. So there was a I think it really opened up opportunities for dialogue. And I mean, Sana can answer that as well. But this had a this had a ripple effect because we were reaching way more people than just had the connection. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, I think my my point is building very similarly off that too. Um, I was also one of the docs for the Ask the Doc series, um, and you know I think that we tend to assume that people coming from more under resourced communities might lack technological um, access, but I think oftentimes when you when you work with community liaisons and with the community directly, you learn that they they are accessing technology all the time, just maybe in a slightly through slightly different pathways than. Um, than we as, as health professionals are. And so a huge amount of the outreach around the Acidoc sessions happened on WhatsApp, um, which is a much better way um, for reaching these communities. And um, you know, finding a platform that can run off of wireless rather than you know, a plan that would eat into someone's data um, is also makes it much more accessible for certain groups. So just not, not coming in with the baseline assumption that any technology is difficult for people to access, but with the idea that they may be accessing it slightly differently, um, that something that involves a long menu in English, that something that involves a lot of data, um, those might be real barriers, but the simple existence of technology is, is likely not a barrier in almost all communities. That's a really great point that I hadn't considered. Thank you, Grace. Sana. Yes, I agree with everybody, but I just want to add that during the pandemic, people were fortunate enough sometimes to have internet access through the schools uh, because the schools provided like free internet or low, uh, they have to, low, people with low income would, would pay less for the internet. And also a lot of uh, organization or companies offered Wi-Fi for free. So some, some of our community members were able to utilize these resources and to be able to have access to the internet. And as Lynn said, most of them had uh, smartphones or they're able to use it and as Renee said that we would have a group of the family members who would be uh, gathered around to listen to us so that that was one of the aspects of having those sessions and having everybody access them from home. Sana, have you seen some of those resources dwindle um, since resources uh, for the schools, I'm not really sure if it's still mm -hmm. available. I think it is, but um, as for other uh, the internet companies, I think it's back to I, I don't. It's not as it used to be in the beginning, where they offered mm -hmm. uh, free Wi-Fi for a lot of people, and uh, that's uh, it's a little bit different than it used to be. So some of the resources really they did like it's different now, so it's not yeah. the same as the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great to see some of those resources make such a large impact that companies or whatever it might be continue to do because they see such a great impact where some of those resources have shifted um, and not available. It can be hard to keep up on that alone. <laughs> um, I do want, there was a question that came in that specifically asked about um, Kayla and Lynn's presentation. And the question was, will your, are your, or will your virtual sessions be available in different languages? Lynn, would you like to take this or would you like <laughs> me to jump in? Uh, so, sort of both. Um, we, we, that is something that is our ultimate goal. Uh, think if it, the platform itself you, people can select the language to view like the menus and things like that. Um, but the content that we load in is currently primarily in English. Um, but it is one of our long-term goals to be able to add things like closed captioning in different languages to the videos, um, you know, as well as, you know, different, the PDFs and things like that. So, um, Kayla's done a, a great job of working with our translation services department to to get that whole process started. But it it is a it's a big it's a big lift. Definitely, I'd love to add to. Um, so while we're working towards standard workflows to improve access to translations when it comes to patient education, I think there is also opportunity for cultural brokerage. 
Um, and so particularly Renee's topic on co-production is very interesting to us. And I think that we perceive it as being very resource intensive and would love to hear more about how maybe that isn't true um, or some workarounds to make it possible to leverage co-production more often. Thank you, Kayla. I just want to mention that a uh, comment came in from the chat, very encouraging of the panel saying, loving this discussion, really appreciate this very specific nuanced and examples. So I, that is public health audience for you. Like, <laughs> Tell us, you know, your successes and your challenges in the most detailed way possible so we can learn from them. Um, I want to shift to a little bit of a question around partnerships. Um, as we know, in healthcare and public health, we can't do anything alone. And some of you have talked about very specific partnerships with community. Um, does anyone want to talk a little bit more about the partnerships that re that happened, even naming specific organizations that helped you or even how you specifically worked with the community? Because sometimes communities can be very hard to access if you haven't had an ongoing partnership. So can anyone talk about what partnership meant for their project? Maren. Thanks. Um, that's a great question and a great point. And I think part of the whole co-production model is to develop those strong partnerships and relationships with existing organizations in your community. So, um, well, with Ask the Doc, we, the Maine and um, the Maine Access Immigrant Network and Maine Medical Center, our uh, Preventive Medicine Fellowship partnered, and we're still forming those partnerships. And it's been wonderful to work with them. Um, and with our Project Echo series, it was all based on partnerships. So when we had, it was, it's a little bit of a different model than the typical clinical model of Project ECHO, um, where our didactic, our 15 minute presentation in the beginning was done by someone who is in the community. So it was either part of a community-based organization or um, some kind of organization that, that services um, disenfranchised communities they would present their knowledge and their, their expertise on a, on a topic. And then the case presentation was actually done by a community health worker. Um, and we tried to kind of get as many different organizations, community health workers from different organizations as possible throughout the 10 week series um, who presented a case, uh, case that they worked with a patient on a, on a specific example and a theme of that echo. So we started developing partnerships throughout the state of different CBOs and um, organizations where we could either get in, involved in and reach more participants and um, have our fellows and our fellowship get involved with. Um, so that's been really great and an amazing experience. You also, I'm just gonna comment, you must have created a very safe space because when people are asked to talk about something that may not have gone well or a problem or an issue, there needs to be a lot of safety in that. So to be able to bring partners together to create a safe space for those conversations. Um, I like to think that's where main community partners shine <laughs> is being able to do that. So thank you, Marin, for describing your project. Any others you wanna talk a little bit about the partnerships that they leveraged, um, any successes or challenges or ways forward? Renee, I think I think that one of the uncomfortable ideas is the notion of shared leadership, and I think that's something that people really struggle with. And I think that in order to have meaningful community engagement, there has to be a component of true co-production, which we define as shared leadership. So, for example, on our hub team, we have some of the people that have been involved um, in community leadership uh, on our hub team. Um, we, we, our, our model of co-production that we use in our community initiatives is that um, people who are end users, um, people who's, who will be using these services are involved in the design, implementation, and review of whatever we do. And that's typical, it's not easy. A lot of trust. There has to be a lot of trust. And like you said, there has to be, there has to be a safe place in, in which you can have these conversations and you have to listen and then you have to, you have to do it or, or you lose that trust. 
Yeah, and I appreciate that the, the language that we're using around co-production, co uh, having been working in public health for decades now, I hadn't really used, heard that term used to describe about working together on a project. I, I really am appreciating that that's very, a it's a very specific term that conjures up very, you know, you are producing this together. Um, I think that's, that can really solidify a partnership. Sana. I also want to add that the, the willingness of and the trust of the community for us and coming into these platforms and talking about their issues is something that we built over the years. It's something these are clients that we had in our office. These are people that we are we are part of this community. So we are known as community health workers and as members in these communities. So the trust that we developed through the years with them, that's what led, led them to join us and trust in us and, and trust in the providers that we chose to work with us and the, the people mm -hmm. that we we had. And we as, as Renee, Renee was one of the first providers and 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 the and and one of the great ones and she also uh she also like worked with she, because she speaks french she also was the one leading the french uh speaking mm -hmm. group uh, or ask the doc so that's something that we we value having people that work that work with us from both sides from the community part and from the provider side great thank you sana we do have a question that came in from the audience. Let me pull it up here. The question is, there was a question of the rural health panel yesterday about the future of the rural health workforce. I'm curious if Valerie or Sana or others can talk about CHWs in supporting rural health. Sana, would you like to go first? I, for us, we work with immigrants, refugees in the area. So this is, it might be a completely different area from where the, the kind of the people that we work with or the communities that we work with. But I think the same idea can be done in rural areas. And it's just, we need someone, a trusted member in the community, someone who's trained enough, someone who's willing to do the work and reach out to the community and bring them, bring people together. I think it's much needed for every community, for every part of the state of Maine, and it's it's something that should be utilized as much as possible. I know, Valerie, if you wanted to add anything. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree with Sana, and I think that we have special, we are paying special attention to our rural um, communities because we know there's underrepresentation of all areas of the workforce there. There is really been hit hard in those areas. And so, and we see some of the outcomes being impacted, I think, because there's a lack of uh, providers that, that are needed up, down to the level again as a CHW. And so a lot of our work, we're and I mentioned earlier, when we're bringing folks in for training, we're really making sure we grab interested parties from the rural areas. And not only is that bringing them into the fold, but it's helping folks in more of our urban areas get to understand the impacts and the specific challenges. And it really, when we talk to community health workers, we are hearing that, you know, if someone's in the uh, northern border area, let's say, how big of a problem transportation is. And so the skills that are needed to go out and make a difference in that community and make an impact and understanding the connections and opportunities are completely different. And it's one of the beautiful things about Maine, but it is something that we really have our eyes on. I happen to be lucky enough to work on another project that we're doing around recovery, uh, enhancing the, and in, impacting the recovery workforce in our rural areas. And we totally see synergy with this because there's plenty of people that are out there that need work and there are plenty of needs for these folks with lived experience. And we wanna make those connections happen and provide the training so that we upskill for the communities. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask a question about looking into the future. Um, so knowing that the work that you have done, what are the things that are on your mind as you adapt to virtual learning, uh, I'm sorry, future learning needs? You know, I started by giving a story of, by, you know, a fictional story by Michael Crichton in 1968 about telehealth, like not that anyone is asking you to project and look in your crystal ball for the next 50 years, but even over just the next two to five years, like, where do you see virtual programming, learning and care going? And what are some of the maybe things that you're looking for and, and ways that you're considering adapting? But, 
so I, I only see it expanding for us. Um, we've had very, very good luck with you know, a lot of success with the, our Think of It classes. Um, I think what we would pl are planning to do is to, um, trying to make it more interactive. Um, you know, for starting out, it is very much like an in-person classroom, you know, where it's, you know, a fairly long video. Um, but as we go along and we learn more, we're trying to make it more interactive and chunk the information up um, and maybe even begin to gamify it a little more um, just to engage patients as much as possible. Um, and then I mentioned the, you know, trying to get, you know, other languages and things like that. We think that's very important. Um, and then the other thing that I, I'm hoping to start bringing in is graphic medicine into some of our, our classes. Um, you know, it's kind of comic style, um, just because it does, it provides almost more equitable access for all different learning styles and neurodiversities. Um, um, and because a lot of it is because it's pictures. So depend, no matter what language you speak, a lot of times you can understand the pictures. Um, so that's something that I really want to bring in going forward as well. That's great. I was actually going to ask you to describe what graphic medicine is. I'd never heard of it. But so it sounds like it's a comic book style, graphic um, novel type style that after raising three kids, I am familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Those are really innovative ways. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing that. Valerie. Um, I wish I could make a prediction, but I, I can say one of the challenges is, uh, and in this particular model that we're using, you know, we want to bring the spirit and the heart and connectivity of a classroom to a flat screen. And one of the biggest challenges is really helping the bandwidth, literally, to have folks stay on camera. Because as faculty or facilitator, you can't see faces. It's really hard to sense the mood of the group and to feel the vibe. And so we wanna create conditions where people wanna stay on camera. So for me, I think that I see that as, an, as a maybe becoming a norm. And mm. because at the beginning, you know, we were training people how to use your mute button or what is Zoom meeting. And we had really specific instructions because it was new to meet like this. And now the general, I think most folks have a general understanding because people have connected at home with people, whether it's a classroom or working, whatever, We've many of us have had the opportunity to learn. And so now how can we take that to the next level? Again, totally echoing um, what you said about more um, interaction so one of the things we do is we've really been using breakout rooms a lot. And we start out every class with introduce yourself to your partner. And so they, so if we were brand new here and I was meeting Kayla, we'd be paired up and I would introduce Kayla to the group. So I had to interview her. So you start building a connection right away and a familiarity. Mm -hmm. And what we found over time is that more people do stay on camera. They're looking at each other, they're joking, and they're starting to really be a cohort. So for me, that's one of the biggest challenges of going fully virtual is losing the spirit of collaborative learning. And mm -hmm. I think we need to continue to be creative, use tools, um, thinking about whiteboards. We have increased our use of polls. We use a lot of visuals. Um, we do, again, sessions that are live, but occasionally we might have a video to show. Um, and so we mix up the media and try to pe keep folks connected. Yeah. So, Yeah, I hear that a lot. I've actually heard the complete opposite happening where some people are actually now thinking they can be on two virtual, like a meeting and a training. I think they've got like multiple screens set up, oh <laughs> which, you know, goes in, an, in another direction that we, we don't want to encourage in any way. <laughs> Sana. I would love for us to be able to uh, help our clients with all their social determinants of health and uh, and and as you all know dependent on their immigration statuses a lot of people have a, a disadvantage or disadvantage in what they can do and what they can't and so this is something that we want to be able to help everybody in our community whether they're asylum seekers asylees refugees uh, any immigrants who've been in the country for a while, maybe, but uh, haven't been able to achieve what, what their goal was. And so uh, 
to be able to use this virtual platform would bring more people together. And also just for the asylum seekers, for example, they don't have, or they have a long period of time where they don't even have uh, a work authorization. And this is something that uh, hinders them. They can't work, they can't, they don't have enough money to be able to, to spend on things and on, on how to join, for example, how to have a smartphone to join Zoom. And so this is something that we were hoping that we are able to help our clients with any kind of, uh, all the social determinants of health. So in order to be able to join us in these kind of sessions or these platforms. Thank you, Sana. Renee. Um, sorry, just to piggyback on a couple of the things that were said by the other panelists, um, you know, going to, towards the future, I think it would be nice if we were even as futuristic as some other countries are now um, in terms of a doctor in every pocket, you know, virtual connections being the norm, whether you're 90 or nine, um, that exists. Um, I think that it also requires a flexibility, um, you know, in our systems to sort of continue to explore how to meet people where they live, work, eat, and play, and how to, if, and if they're on screens, then that's where we meet them, um, and to sort of push the envelope, we, you know, we should be texting patients. Um, many offices do, but many do not, can't, can't clear the HIPAA, you know, hurdles for texting patients, but these are things that there, there's a lot of things that if we sort of um, look at what's available, we might be able to institute now. And I think it just requires this plasticity or flexibility of how we think about things. And, and that would be my hope was that we embrace a little more cultural flexibility in how we approach, how we interact with people. Yeah, I agree with what with what everyone has been saying, and I wanted to add. I think it's starting to shift this way, but I think we've gone from looking at um, telehealth and virtual connections from being something that's sort of cutting edge and offered to maybe the highest income, most connected people to something that can actually be a way of expanding access and of reaching into disadvantaged communities and reaching people who might otherwise be isolated or might otherwise have barriers to accessing care. And I think that shift is starting to happen in how we look at um, virtual connections and telemedicine. And um, But I think that we're still on the cusp of that. And I, and I hope and expect that over the next few years, we'll see more and more of those efforts to expand it out from being sort of an elite thing that's offered to being really a barrier breaking thing that's offered. One of the common themes that we've talked about today is how virtual programming, learning and other opportunities are very closely linked to the social determinants of health. Um, whether it's addressing social determinants health, breaking down barriers. And I know that in public health, particularly, we are starting to look even further upstream to structural determinants of health. Um, and what are those structures that are in place that lead to some of our social needs um, and health outcomes? So thinking about the work that you're doing, what type of structures would need to change for you to be able to do your work easier, better, more efficient, bigger reach, whatever whatever sort of more success looks like for you. I know this is more of a philosophical question. Well, far be it for me to be the last comment, but the biggest structural barrier that I can think of is bias, plain and simple. Pick your bias, it's, this, it's the biggest barrier to getting change done, whether it's because you're always used to doing something a certain way or whether it's inherent bias, um, that's been the biggest barrier that we faced. It's interesting that you say that because I think about a comment that Grace just made about sometimes the assumption that people in certain communities just don't have access to to technology where the access could be there, but you need to find modifications to meet everyone's needs. You know, there can be, some of those decisions can be made. Even as simple as that could be made in bias. So thank you, Brian. Yes, Kayla. 
Um, we have been working a lot with our interpreter and cross-cultural services department. And one of the things that continues to come up for us is um, when you're planning, when you're making plans, when you're developing a program, when you're building a new office practice, when you have that first kind of idea of something you want to offer to your community, asking the right questions, uh, making sure that you have representation in the room, in the planning discussion so that you're addressing barriers right away rather than trying to go back and fix them later. And I think particularly with our department, we feel the strain of that a lot. We get, you know, down the road with educational materials um, and then we're, we're asking the questions. And if we had them a little sooner, we might be able to avoid those barriers altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Kara. Merit. I think um, time, like giving clinicians and staff time to participate in these offerings is really crucial. I know, you know, with our ECHO series, we want, it's open to everybody. It's open to public health professionals, it's open to CH, CHWs, nurses, social workers, providers. And some of the information given on these sessions are really important for provider a clinic clinical staff to know too but um the time in their schedule is so limited that it's hard for them to participate and to get this knowledge and to get this knowledge on you know other organizations and what they do and resources and how they can refer their patients to these organizations they're missing out on that um, even if it's a virtual method because of the time that it, it you know it takes to to attend these when they have busy clinical schedules so that's a big barrier for in terms of time um, for, for structural things to change. Thank you, Mary, for highlighting that. It's definitely, I was thinking about, I think it was Valerie, you mentioned that one way that you're overcoming attendance issues is by having the supervisor um, sign off that they support this participation. You know, I think about in what you just said, Mary, like how is leadership involved in health professions participating in these important learning environment by just saying, oh, that's fine for you to sign up. Of course, go ahead and do that. You know, you figure out what time you're going to, you're going to be able to fit it into, and you may or may not be able to attend in a consistent way. Um, so looking for those ways to have leadership and bring it back to the values of the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time. <laughs> that's Quite the structure. Hey, Marin, in the chat, Marin has provided um, a registration link um, for people in the audience to be able to participate. And others on the panel, please feel free to also share other resources about your program um, and, and resources. So we have two minutes left. I just want to open it up for another minute or so if any of the panelists have any other final comments that you'd like to share with our audience today. With that, I will bring our panel to a close. I want to thank all our panelists for your time, um, for your attendance, for your presence, and for you know continuing to do the great work that you do, but just to also share it with everybody. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think we all enjoy working in Maine, because we realize that we're a small community, um, and that sharing information and lessons learned are the only way that we're going to continue to move forward. Um, and also appreciate um, what, what was interesting is whenever we talked about what some of the barriers were, sometimes in these conversations, it always comes down to money, more money, but we kept that mm. out of the conversation because we knew that could do wonderful things, but that we really focused on some of those barriers that we could actually solve working together. Um, so I want to thank you for that. So Becca, any other final thoughts from you? That was great. I love this conversation. Uh, it was so nice to hear you all kind of building off of each other and sharing about your different work and um, so the fun part, right, is like the intersectionality, but then how we're all like a little bit different too. So that was great. Um, and well done moderating, Jen. That was a, a very dynamic discussion to have to stay on top of. Uh, so I want to thank you all so much uh, for being here and for, for sharing your, uh, your work with our attendees. And I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us as well. We really hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, I did just put another little plug for the evaluation in the chat. So please do complete that. 
our next session, supporting our seafaring community through increased cultural competence and wellness promotion. We'll start in about 10 minutes, just as we transition speakers. So, um, you know, hop up, maybe get some afternoon uh, caffeine in you, walk around for a bit, and we'll see you back here at 140. Thank you. Thank you.